and welcome back to the 10th edition of the annual academic conference 2021 hosted by the department of humanities and social sciences iit madras i take this opportunity to welcome and introduce professor katie ravindran our final speaker in the keynote lecture series <laughs> professor katie ravindran is an urban designer who is a member of governing council of intac and is the chairman of the architectural heritage advisory committee he is a founding trustee of the indian heritage cities network trustee of the madhavan nayar foundation and was member of the advisory board for the united nations capital master plan new york he was also dean and senior advisor bricks school of built environment member of the international jury for the ap capital complex and subsequently member of the expert committee for balanced regional growth of andhra pradesh state including the capital he was formerly vice chairman of the environmental impact assessment committee government of india his most recent work was the preparation of resilient urban design framework for low income state housing in tamil nadu he taught urban design for three decades in SPA Delhi and was the founding or president of the Institute of Urban Designers India. Member, Governing Council of NID, Ahmedabad and Vijayawada. Member, National Advisory Committee of Hriday Cities. Mentor for the Smart City Mission on Public Spaces. He was former chairman of Delhi Urban Art Commission. He has traveled extensively across the world and his current practices includes design of greenfield cities, cultural buildings, memorials, adaptive reuse and urban conservation. His works and research are published in journals and books internationally. He has consistently pursued sustainable architecture and urban design championing the cause in in multiple international forums and academia he will be delivering a small talk on the topic spatiality some dimensions now before we be, before we begin i would like to gently remind all participants to remain muted through the lecture please change your layout on the screen to focus or stage through the button on the top right corner of your screen for a better experience Post the talk, participants can raise hands and our team members will recognize you to ask questions. The talk will be recorded for archival purposes. Use of derogatory or offensive language will attract strict actions. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, Professor K.T. Ravindran. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to say come back to your department because in the initial years i don't know some 20 years ago i was uh, an examiner for a phd program in your school and uh, i did my architecture across the road from the iit campus in uh, ac college of technology which was known as ac college of technology at that time now it is the anna university so uh, anything to do with IIT Chennai, IIT Madras is for me like homecoming. So thank you for having me on the one. And uh, before I start on the presentation, uh, I'd like to tell you that uh, as I see it, a keynote is not aligned to any theme which is in the, in which you have had in the discussions. A keynote is something which explores the quintessential nature, quintessential nature of the subject, rather than aligning, in, aligning it to any of the topics which have been discussed. Yeah? So, from that perspective, maybe uh, we'll find this kind of going in a different direction from what you've been hearing earlier, and uh, which is fine because we need to hear all kinds of things. Yeah. So, uh, I'll now share my screen. Uh, at the onset, uh, I want to congratulate the person who chose the subject called spatiality and not space. 
because spatiality is, uh, sp while space is a kind of an entity, spatiality is a condition. It's a relationship between your mind and space. Uh, and it's the condition of that relationship, it's the changing relationship, actually defines what speciality is. And from that perspective, you can have multiple viewpoints, multiple realities, multiple methods of understanding spatiality. And I will explore some of them in this uh, talk. No, I've called it some dimensions because it has many, many dimensions. Dimensions here could mean aspects or differing natures of spatiality. It also has, uh, has a contradiction in it. It has uh, a contradiction in it, in the sense that uh, spatiality is a subjective condition, which is qualitative and therefore non-negotiable through dimensions. When you say dimensions, I mean the kind of measurements that we do. It has dimension has these two meanings, depending on how you view it it changes its meaning and it brings in a kind of a dichotomous counterpoint position to speciality when you see it as a method of measurement. So dimensions imply qualitative expression of speciality, which is directly linked to perception that generates a certain conditions of space. Measurement is at best an instrument to negotiate these dimensions as our cognitive capacities are limited in understanding wholeness of an entity. In other words, we need to use measurement, we use mathematics and we use measurement uh, as uh, instruments to represent, uh, to be able to capture uh, the actual real nature of space uh, because our cognitive capacities are limited to understand the wholeness of space. So crossing the subjective threshold, when you, uh, in other words, there's a subjective threshold in the mind beyond which you have what has been traditionally called Akasha. Akasha is of course a Sanskrit word, but it's now used universally across many disciplines across, across the world in many cultures. Uh, it becomes spatiality and Akasha is that which gives space and makes room for the existence of all extended substances. In other words, it's seen as an all pervasive entity, entering everything, exiting everything all the time, inside us, outside us, engulfing every object, defining every object, at the same time being inside those objects. So it's a, uh, it's a kind of condition that we cannot really grasp to represent in the form of a drawing so that we can construct something using that drawing. So we use many different kinds of abstractions. First abstraction is that we measure and we give it a numerical identity. We use the line which is, a, which is a very high level of abstraction because there are no lines in nature. One thing just ends and the another thing begins. We convert that transition into a line and we use lines to represent the uh, measurements that we have in our head. And therefore, going through these two different kinds of abstractions, we try to represent a space in the form of a building or a, or a room or an enclosure or whatever. And then from there, we uh, try to build something. So we, in fact, cross many subjective thresholds, uh, traversing the space of Akasha and 
defining the physical entity in dimensions. As such, measurement and dimensions are our instruments to grasp the totality of spatiality. So, uh, spatiality is a very slippery subject. It's there, it's not there. It's measurable, it's not measurable. It's perceivable, it's not perceivable. It's outside us, it's inside us. It is a kind of a contradictory position, a continuously contradictory position, which uh, when we apply the word dimensions, dimensions become an oxymoron yeah, in relationship with speciality. So here you have an image uh, by uh, Rene Magritte. It's called the false mirror. Refers very directly to our perception. So in the human position, in relationship to the universe is modulated by consciousness. In other words, it is when we apply our consciousness to the any entity, anything in the universe that uh, uh, our world is born, our physical world is born, because when we lose consciousness, it doesn't exist. Yeah? So the perception of self and subjectivities are generated at the threshold of consciousness as the mind's eye. And I think this uh, image by René Magritte perfectly reflects that condition where a few, through a human eye or in the human eye is the reflection of space or the human eye is perceiving space or the space is inside the human eye. You can interpret it the way you want to interpret it. When you try to create an image of a speciality, it is a subjective, hyper alternating and limited attempt. Yeah? It's continuously changing depending on the view of view. It's, it's an image which of something that doesn't exist. It's a subjective recreation. And that subjectivity is continually altering depending on your viewpoint, how you see. It. And it's impacting our mind in a way that it's helping our mind to use certain limitations like dimensions to be able to grasp that. Now here I move to another aspect, another dimension of space, which is the space form conundrum. Now here the question is, does form generate space or space defines form? This is a question that we eternally ask. All designers ask this. Is the space outside an object important? Is the space inside the object important? Or is the space that is engulfing the object important? Or is the object itself is important? We try to manipulate the object by defining its characteristics vis-a-vis -vis space. And it's a it is conditional to the relationship between space and form that our spatiality is developed. So, spatiality is the field in which form is nested. In uh, this very famous uh, Dutch painter called M. C. Escher, M. C. Escher's work. In fact, M. C. Escher's work goes far beyond painting or you know any kind of representational art. And this relationship is pushed to an extreme where the form becomes the field. That is, every object has a field. In other words, every form has a field in which it exists, without which it cannot be defined. And in Escher's work, if this relationship is taken to an extreme where form becomes the field and the field becomes the form, throwing open the illusion of duality, that there are these two things called form and space. Spatiality here is represented as an internally 
counterpointing reality. When you see his work, I, which I'll be showing you just subsequently, you'll realize the point that I'm making. And perspective is defied by Escher by collapsing time-space relationships into one spatiality. Very interestingly, uh, Escher in his work destroys perspective. And what is perspective? Perspective is representation of objects in space, but defining the distance between the viewer and the object, continually changing the viewer, uh, this relationship between the viewer and the object. And that's how we represent the perspective drawing. Yeah? And perspective is what helps us see the third dimension of something. Whereas Escher collapses this relationship. In other words, he collapses time and space. That is the distance denote both spatial distance as well as the time it would take to move from one point, point A to point B. Yeah? So both these are collapsed in his work and it creates a new kind of speciality. Here's an example of his work, very famous examples. I'm sure all of you must have seen this. It is almost like an evolutionary diagram where from the fish evolves the bird. Yeah? And uh, it's called Sky and Water by M.C. Escher. And in this case, the uh, the the image of the fish slowly, slowly becomes the field to form the, the image of the bird. And the bird penetrates the image of the fish to define the fish. So there's a mutual counterpointing of space and form. There's a mutual counterpointing of field and object. And they come together seamlessly generating each other without any perspective. So that idea of distance is actually formulated by the geometry of the, of the whole composition. And from, dark, from, the, from a dark background, it moves to the white and the object becomes slowly, slowly, object becomes black. And the background, that's the field becomes white and the object becomes black. This is actually a, a very interesting mind game that Escher actually unleashed when he started this kind of work. And he did a series of this. I'm only showing you a few examples of it. <coughs> so in such a kind of dichotomous condition, how do we grasp spatiality? How do we attempt to grasp it? The only, only way our limited uh, capacity to, to understand, to grasp the spatiality is to return to dimension. That's, there is no other way that we can actually define spatiality. So when we want to draw a wall or we draw a number of walls in a configuration as to enclose a space and throw out certain other spaces. We include something, we exclude something. Yeah? And to contain an, an otherwise infinite space, we use measurements, which then create the speciality. That's the relationship creates the speciality. This drawing is from uh, Piranesi, a well-known uh, Italian painter, who created, who actually negotiated the vertical space uh, continuously to, uh, to bring in multiple realities which are overlaid in the vertical space. That's the drawing. And uh, when you come to mathematics, which we use to understand space, because without mathematics, we cannot understand space. In fact, mathematics is our foremost instrument to understand space. And also we use it to measure energies and so on, but space cannot be understood by any, or cannot be conquered, cannot be grasped by in any other way than through a mathematical form. So a mathematical formula, when it is brought to a perfect state of perfection, when nothing can be added, nothing can be removed from it, 
it comes to a point where it attains a stillness and a certain beauty in that stillness. So a pure, a pure developed, purely developed formula becomes a beautiful object, aesthetically a beautiful object, because it's at once spaceless and it's timeless, which is another expression of Akasha. And every enclosure is a microcosm of the universe. And therefore, every room that we create is a microcosm of the of the Akasha that we are enclosing. So every building actually is an attempt to enclose that space in some way and externalize some of it by using form. And in that process, we define the speciality of that experience. And it is that experience that we, the user encounters when he or she enters a building, a room, a space. So much as light and speed can also alter spatiality, that is depending on the kind of application of light, you can change your experience of spatiality. By changing your speed, you can change your spatiality. That's the way you move through space can be accelerated to change the experience of spatiality. As much as all this can happen, just the sensation of fast, fast blowing wind on your body can also create a special. In other words, all our sensory uh, uh, instruments are put to use in the way we grasp spatiality. So it's not just mathematical abstraction of uh, uh, a formula or a, or a proportion of space or it's not just the abstraction of lines, but it is also all these together, all other sensations that appeal to our sensory apparatus are what creates our state of speciality, creates speciality. So in other words, it's a very nuanced thing, the formation of speciality. And these nuances are, kind of, are a designer actually attempts to construct these experiences, actually attempts to, to assess these experiences or to predict these experiences, and then tries to build that in by using mathematical proportions and outlines and rooms and so on, material objects. In a way, trying to predict the experience of that special. But my experience of having practiced for so many years as a designer, I can tell you that you can never ever fully design a space. After you, after the object comes into being, you walk into the space, your experience of that is a completely new experience. And this is something which can only be uh, understood when you experience it, it cannot be described. To an extent, cinema tries to capture that to an extent, or a moving image, a video can capture that in a certain way. But a video has a very specific viewpoint of the camera and specific trajectories of movements because you cannot move everywhere all the time. And therefore, it still is an abstraction of the experience of that space. So, in other words, to understand that speciality is a very nuanced entity is the most central thing in understanding the nature of speciality and our attempts to conquer it through design. Uh, in sound, in music, for instance, the pauses between two notes creates speciality. The length that you pause between two notes is as structurally important to the sound, to music, as the different notes, which are entities, identifiable entities in the structure of music. And that, in fact, is uh, that pause is actually a modulation of time, not only of space. So here again, you see the collapse of time and space, and that's why people like Ramanuja was not just a mathematician, but also a musician. 
it's very easy for a musician to move into mathematics and the mathematicians to move into music because the two are so completely correlated. It's the same attempt that we do by physical lines and measurement uh, uh, in design, in physical design, that the musician does while composing a piece of music. Here's an example of how light can become the a dimensional speciality. The image that you see is of, of, from Stravana Beligula. Beligula means the big tank. And that's what you see in the foreground. The rectangle that you see is actually uh, around, the, around the major tank around which there is a settlement. And on top of the hill, as you can see, the light is moving at just that slanted line represents height. We have already negotiated massive height by just by that slanted line and the changing intensities of its light. You know? So the object of veneration received receive a heightened speciality in the dark. It's lit to isolate, connect, or isolate is one thing, and to connect is the opposite of it, and to bring an altered legibility to the landscape. In other words, we, in the night, the whole spatiality is recreated, or it's not really recreated, it's reinterpreted through the use of light. So the next section I want to cover is spatiality as a cultural construct. Basically, the idea of the cultural construct is posited on this diagram that you see here is the relationship between our external physical environment and our internal environment, which we call culture. Yeah. So uh, every biome generates an internal environment, which then gives rise to a certain development of a culture. And this is a continuum. It's not, they are not two separate entities like we perceive as the outside and the inside. It is actually a continuum. That's the domain of the Akasha that you see between the two, uh, two extremities. Uh, that, that space, that lingering relationship is, is the space of Akasha. And we have people's relationship. Sorry, there's some interruption. Annotate the shared document. Okay. There's a request to annotate the share, shared document. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry for the interruption. So people's relationship with the external environment generates an internal rhythm in us. That's there's a definition of time space in us, inside us, as a result of our relationship with our external environment which then expresses itself in multiple layers in, our, in us, which we call culture, in our language, in music. Language, for instance, is the most nuanced, most wonderful expression of that relationship of culture. In music, in performing arts, in visual arts, in architecture, and even in the articulation of speciality. So all these are expressions of what we call culture. And therefore, spatiality is not uh, an isolated object. It is a cultural construct, construct in which the subjectivity, our subjectivity is the prime driver to define the cultural context. What we call culture is an expression of this internal rhythm. In other words, there is a beat inside all of us which is what comes out as expressions of all these. That's why there is so much difference in the way we speak English language. We speak English language one way in Chennai and another way in Punjab, and in a different way in Kashmir, and in a third way in the Northeast, because there are these changing internal rhythms which are related to our biome, and all the gamut of history and culture and events and landscape and uh, the 
heat and the cold and everything has an impact on the way we define our internal rhythms. And as these rhythms vary from place to place, rhythm meaning the relationship between time and space changes, our cultural expression also changes. Here is an example of how the same concept that Escher talked about is also manifest in the way the Jaina idol is conceived. As you as you all know, probably know, uh, in Jainism, uh, there is no uh, there is no external agency like God, but there is a point in which your soul uh, is becomes the non-present. In other words, that's what Escher also does. Escher's concept of figure ground finds parallel in the way the figure ground is expressed in the Jaina uh, idol here, where Shunyata, which is uh, the absence, or absence actually cannot describe it entirely, because absence in turn implies a presence without which there is no absence. So in fact, that is what the golden sheet does in this case, that creates that creates the space for the absence. If you remove the golden plate, there is no figure, there is no absence, there is no presence. Yeah? So it's very, very closely parallel to the way the ideation process of Escher takes place in the formation of figure ground and Shunyata is the absence, define the presence of its field in Janus. Shunyata is a very interesting concept and it has very deep resonance in, uh, in our Indian heritage and history. Uh, I'll cover some more of it a little later. Here is another example of the same concept of Shunyata. So when the concept of Shunyata, that is an absence becomes a speciality, the cave becomes its expression. Interestingly, a cave is not a constructed space. Instead of constructing a space, you extract the materiality that forms a, a, that forms a cave which actually is a space that is generated by extraction and not by construction. Yeah. This is why the Jain Munis uh, from, I don't know, for how many thousands of years sat in caves to meditate because the cave represents that Tunyata, the absence of form, and, and therefore becomes a kind of speciality which comes closest to the experience of Shunyata, which is the central concept in Jainism. There's a lot that can be said about this, but I will not go into more detail. And uh, here is a different case of a cultural construct. The skyline that you see here is of Madurai. And uh, you can see how the four Gopras of the Minakshi temple, in fact, defines the a sacred space. Yeah. The, the grand sacred space is defined by the skyline, not by talking about the center, but just by defining the periphery, much like the golden plate is defining the absent in, in the Jain idol, the four Gopuras define the centrality of uh, the sacred space and it, that signifies the intimate dark sacred Garbhagraha of the temple. In the middle of this kind of rarefied field between these uh, uh, four Gopuras is a space which is intimate, dark and personal because it is that kind of relationship that uh, the that form of worship demands is a one-to-one -one relationship with the, with the deity, one-to-one -one relationship with divinity and that does not require space and grandeur and light and all that. Of course, people go and put 
gold and they put all sorts of precious objects now because that's their limitation to attribute preciousness to objects. But the actual preciousness is in the one-to-one -one relationship, the intimate relationship that the deity and the worshipper has. And that doesn't require a large special articulation. So something almost like the recreation of a cave is what is attempted in the case of the Garbhagriha, where there is a that one-to-one -one relationship is celebrated. But at the city level, to bring a certain degree of grandeur to that relationship, a space definition is articulated by the location of these vocalists. This image is from a Jain Mandir in Old Delhi. Uh, by the way, all these pictures are my own pictures. They are not taken from anywhere, except for those which are referred to in the, the drawings, etc., which are referred to the artwork. Uh, the, the artists' reproductions, which are referred to, they are all from places with the location is mentioned. But all these images are my own images. So I am, in fact, speaking to you about these spaces from an experiential perspective, as someone who has actually experienced these spaces. So this cultural construct, space as a con cultural construct, speciality as a con cultural construct, is a pervasive thing that you see in so many variations of cultures across the world. So this is the courtyard inside a Jain temple. And that courtyard becomes a place of, uh, uh, becomes a place of the sacred. It's a space of ritual. It's also a social space people, where people eat and share food. And the, the, the discourse happens by the Muni who's sitting not central to this space, but on the side of the space. So this is an expression of the court as a, the speciality of the court, which actually accommodates a certain kind of cultural function, uh, which is in fact not something that is isolated from society, but is emanating from the internal rhythm of that culture and uh, emerging as a, as a collective expression of uh, worship. In Jainism, as you know, there is no God, there's no manifest God. There's only the Tirthankaras or the Gurus. And this is, of course, a Digambara saint who is sitting and uh, providing the discourse here. Now, I'm showing, I want to show you the best, the finest example of spatial articulation in, the, in my experience. The finest example of spatial articulation in the world is that of the Piazza del Campo in Siena, in Italy, where narrow streets, you can see narrow streets, you know, uh, can you see, I don't know if whether you can see my cursor moving, you can see these narrow streets which open into the, into the space from all directions, narrow streets come and suddenly burst open into an enormous space, which is actually a civic space. Yeah? It's not a religious space. Now, most Italian Renaissance towns have two major spaces. One is a civic space appended to the local municipality and the clock tower, and the other is the space in front of the cathedral, which is a religious gathering space. So most medieval Italian towns have these two spaces parallelly because there were these two powers, the power of the church and the power of, the, of governance of uh, the oligarchy or the monarch that is on the other side, which is, which is what generated the civic space and one generated the, the religious space. So this, uh, the speciality of the paleo game space, that's, there's a certain game that happens in this square where, in fact, uh, there's a horse race that happens in between, which is called paleo. In Siena, it forms the outdoor room that is the very identity of the town itself. Without this space, Siena town doesn't exist without the, without the quality characteristics and the and the nature of this space. And the power of religion and ritual is expressed in this space, which acts as social ritual space in Sierra. In fact, 
the whole paleo game is played between different communities of the or different neighborhoods or traditional clustering of uh, population in Siena. And this is an image of such, game, such a game happening a few years ago when I was there, where the entire space is filled. It's the same space that you see here. Entire space is filled with people, but people sitting in different, different segments, divided into community groups and competing in the game. Yeah. So this space becomes the venue of bringing the entire town together annually once to recreate a ritual which actually identifies their civic identity. It's a very interesting space. I can go on for a long time, which I will not do for a year. And uh, now I show you a space from Iran. I happened to work three years in Iran and used to travel into the deserts uh, uh, every every time I got a little time, I would take a car and go into the desert. And this is one of those occasions where I chanced upon a village where there is the Moharam procession happening. You know? So during the dramatic annual religious reenactment of the Moharam theater, that is Moharam theater is representing the the uh, Ali going to uh, to Iraq to bring water for the people of uh, Iran and is attacked and his hand is chopped off in Iraq and he comes back bleeding. That's the image that you see on top. And, and this, this whole event is, I've just described you just the outline of this event. It's a far more nuanced story. And this whole event is enacted in this public square of this little village in which you can see Thousands and th the entire village comes and stands around and uses the whole public square as an amphitheater. And it becomes, in other words, the space is a cultural construct, which is specifically designated for this enactment every year. Yeah? And it's such an emotional scene that by the end of this whole day's festival, everybody's sobbing, the whole crowd is crying, men, women, young, old. Everybody is weeping because of the moving experience of watching this in this kind of enclosed space. You know? So uh, the village square turns into an amphitheater where day long dramatization of Ali's sacred journey to Karbala is reenacted. You know? This is another expression of a cultural construct, a space as a cultural construct. You have a later example of how the uh, between the colonial powers and the cultures of the North, North Indian population, how a difference in uh, space form relationship, in other words, the construction of speciality as a cultural construct was defined. That is, there are two contrasting typologies of buildings that one finds. One has the, the court, which is eliminated from the center of a block, which is the traditional uh, uh, form of the North Indian uh, courtyard form. And the British form, on the contrary, is just that central space is built up as an object surrounded by space. So one is form is surrounding the space, and in the other, space is surrounding the form. So this dramatic relationship uh, that is diametrically opposite relationship uh, is reflected not simply in built form of individual buildings, but in the whole structure of the city itself. On the top, you have a drawing of the, of what is called the Chandani Chowk, which is the central open space in uh, the old, old, old city of Delhi. And the other is the, constructed form of the India Gate and the whole Rajpath, where you have the prisoners estate, the India Gate, and so on and so forth, as designed by the Athens. In this, the buildings are in space. In the Latins plan, the buildings are surrounded by space. And in the other plan, in the Chandni Chowk, 
this the form actually defines the space which is in the center. Okay. So these are two diametrically opposite ways of looking at it. While the red fort sits in the eastern end of Chandni Chowk, facing the west. Uh, that is the red fort, which is the prime object of uh, power in the old city, is actually facing this uh, facing Chandni Chowk, which is this central space that you see here, and uh, its face is west. And the viceroy's house, which is built a little bit away from this line, parallel to this, interestingly, in in geometry. Parallel to the same Chandni Chowk, Latins do, drew his uh, power lines in which the main object, which is the main power center of the Viceroy's house, is facing east. So they are looking in opposite directions, in opposing types of space definitions, reflecting, I don't know whether it was a deliberate thing or it is a, an uncanny expression of cultures that. This dichotomous relationship is clear and seen all across the landscape between these two places. Now, the Shah Jahanabad, as I said, has, has what is called a Haveli typology, okay, in which form defines space, and Imperial Delhi uses the bungalow typology, which is building in the garden where space defines the form. Now, it's not only that just as a uh, as a cultural construct, spatiality has an impact on us. That it it is uh, it's an externalized rhythm of of the people. At the same time, it also once coming into being, it exerts a kind of soft power on people. Yeah? There's a soft power of space, which actually. Our our gaze is always on the visuality. Of form which dominate our psyche. Yet it is the spatiality that has the transformative power and the potency to represent the mind of a culture. I will leave it at that. If there's any doubt, I can discuss this in the in the discussions. Spatiality is also an expression of power. Yeah? And very interestingly, the staircase becomes a very interesting component in the interior of buildings, as well as sometimes even in external staircases, like in that grand scene in Battleship Potomkin, you have that whole war that takes place on the staircase, fight that takes place on a set of steps, tumbling down the steps. But it's, a, it's very interestingly a recurring theme in Indian popular cinema. Okay. That is, staircase itself has undergone a kind of a so, sociological repositioning continuously through time. Yeah. So when it comes to vertical articulation of spatiality and its expression through the device of staircase in cinema, is a recurring theme to represent power, notwithstanding the Freudian interpretation of heightening the sexual experience. In Freudian interpretation, the, uh, the climbing of a staircase represents actually a sexual experience. Yeah. And uh, whereas in, uh, <clears throat> in, in the living room of the rich man in the, in the film world, Starting right from Hollywood, it became a, a, a recurring theme in the Indian cinema, where the staircase becomes a, a representation of the power of the person who owns the place. Yeah? The image that you see here is from a very famous film called Engavi to Pillai. It's, it was, I think, released in 60s, 65 or something. And, uh, this, uh, it has a very interesting sequence where MGR sings this song, uh, declaring his uh, uh, affiliation to the working class and his disdain and disgust for the rich in this space, in the space of the staircase. Yeah? 
So he comes into the rich man's house and he pushes all the rich people out and he dances with, with the working people inside the house and he goes up and down the staircase with, uh, with a whip in his hand, cracking his whip, expressing his anger, expressing his affinity, affiliation to the poor. And this, it was this film which actually primarily uh, prepared MGR to enter the world of politics and finally to ascend the staircase to reach the climax of being the chief minister. Yeah. Of course, this was a recurring theme subsequently. After that, MGR was represented as, as a champion of the poor in so many more movies. In fact, every movie that he came out with had a political message positioning him as the leader of the poor, positioning as a champion of the poor who beats, the, beats up the rich and supports the poor. Not exactly like a not as much like uh, like a Robin Hood, which was actually Malay Kallan, which was a much earlier film in Tamil, was a Robin Hood film. This is a different form of representation of a champion of popular leadership. Yeah. And the staircase becomes the venue for articulating this for this film. Those of you who have not seen it, you can go to the... I couldn't rep reproduce it here because the copyright issues and so on. Uh, but you can go to YouTube and see this film, Engavi to Pillai, and see this unbelievable sequence where MGR is almost frolicking and dancing on top of the staircase and declaring his affiliation with the poor. So it's a, it's a, and this is just, I'm giving this film was so popular, it in fact launched uh, MGR as one. Well. It was a Telugu film called Ramadu. Uh, it is called Ramdu Bimudu in Telugu, and it was also reproduced again in, in as Ram Ram or Shyam in Hindi with Dilip Kumar. So in in Telugu you had MTR, here you had MGR, and in Bombay you had Dilip Kumar. All the major icons of that time, they were all represented fighting the evil, fighting the rich, on the staircase. I'm just giving you this as an example, but it's a recurring theme. When the stairs in an old Indian build, Indian buildings were actually steep, like ladders, they were like narrow, steep things. Like in every old in my own house in Kerala, the staircase is actually a very steep, narrow, almost ladder-like wooden construction. But in the Hindi film, finally imports this grand staircase from the Renaissance palaces. That is the, the the oligarchy of medieval Europe built their palaces with this grand staircase as a, as an object on display, and then it becomes the new representation of power and wealth in and snobbery in in Hollywood first, and then subsequently in Bollywood and in all other parts of India. So this is a recurring theme of in popular cinema which actually negotiates the speciality in a vertical order, because in the vertical lies more power than in the horizontal. It's also a larger topic for discussion. I won't go into more details. I, I move on to a, a more nuanced uh, form of uh, definition of uh, speciality is by the idea of place, not place as a, as a physical entity, but place as a sociological entity, location and field. So place, location and field are critical components which define speciality. Yeah. So here you have the image of uh, uh, the the temple called it's called Mangalnath Temple in Ujjain. Yeah, this is where Varaha Mehra, who who defined the zero point in time, like the Greenwich Mean Time, the Indian Mean uh, Mean Time was the zero point in time located in this one temple where the snake is. Yeah? And this is supposed to be the place where the planet Mars is born. Planet Mars, which is troubling so many of us now. In, when it comes to a marriage, uh, the influence of Mars becomes the most critical aspect to be looked at. 
and we we this is what actually makes or breaks many social ties between people even today. So this Mars was born in Ujjain, and Varaha Mehra was the main mathematician and astronomer of that time of uh, uh, of Ujjain. He was one of the twelve. Uh, Navaratnas, uh, sorry, nine Ratnas, that's the Navaratnas of Vikramaditya's court. He was a mathematician and he identified this location for the zero point in time. And just like Greenwich Mean Time, is the right and left and front and back of this thing, time uh, sequences changed. And Uj interestingly, it is also Ujjain which is known as Ujjain, which in which it, this is located, this temple is located, is also known as the Kshetra Dipati. Kshetra literally means a field, yeah, or a field of influence, and Ujjain is the lord of space because the Mahakal temple of Shiva is located in Ujjain. Yeah. Mahakal literally means the grand time, or the Lord of Time, which is Shiva. And there are 12 Jyotirlingas scattered all over the subcontinent of which Ujjain is the center. In other words, there's a spatial concept to the power of Shiva. And this speciality of this concept is defined in the locations of these 12 Jyotirlingas, which are across the subcontinent, not just in India now. Some, some of them are falling in Afghanistan and Pakistan and so on. And these 12 Jyotirlingas, in fact, define its center as in Ujjain, which is the lord of the Chetra, lord of the field. Yeah. So it's a, there's a speciality that is construct, conceptual speciality, which is constructed and a place, a location and a field is defined to anchor that in space. That is the Mangalnath temple and the Mahakal temple in, in Ujjain. Mahakal Temple, of course, was a burial ground or a cremation ground, which then later acquired its current status. And the Kumbh Mela that happens every 12 years in Ujjain starts on the day in which this Mars begins its movement. So it's a very, very interesting, very complex concept of speciality, which connects to even the astronomical positioning of uh, stars and the location or of specific uh, locations within uh, the physical entity of the town and the events that occur every 12 years as the Kumbh Mela happening in the same town, just the Mahakal temple being the most critical location for it. It's a very, very interesting concept. I don't have time to go into more details, so I'll very quickly conclude. I have a whole section on uh, speci speciality of hegemonies. Uh, I move into the current time right now, where location, height, scale, geometry, space, royal affinities, materials, architectural details, all were deployed as ingredients of urban design to cement hegemonies. This is, I'm giving you the example of the design of the central vista in in Delhi, which is our seat of central government, and how the whole place was conceptualized originally by Edwin Lutyens in the British period, where he made a section showing how the president's house will be actually sitting in a higher place than the Jama Masjid to which an access was connected. It's almost like Hanuman going and sitting on his own tail in Lanka to show that he is sitting on a higher throne than Ravana. It was, it was that kind of an analogy that was being used here. In other words, vertical definition of vertical speciality was the source of power articulated here. And I'll quickly go through this example. Here is an example of the central vista as it exists now. Uh, it's being modified soon. It'll be modified soon. What you see in the extreme end on the upper part of the photograph is the is the president's house and the seat of the central government. Uh, in the center is the president's house. You have the north block and the south block on either side. And you see India Gate and the Chatri just at this end of it. The whole distance is about three and a half kilometers or so. Okay. 
three and a half to four kilometers. Now, this is the structure of the plan that was drawn by uh, Edwin Lutyens, where you can see that an access, I don't know whether, I hope you can see my cursor. This is the access which connected the parliament to the old city. Yeah, this is what later became the Connaught Place circle, but this actually goes, one goes here and one line goes here. I'll show you more details. Here is how that was constructed at the time by Latin's visual structure, how he defined speciality as a method of establishing hegemony over the Indian people. Number one, of course, is the Viceroy's house, built in 1927. You can see you have to read the diagram and the, and the photographs together. And uh, he used terminal elements in these locations, terminal elements which are signified by their value or worth, which are connected through a certain spatiality. So on the one hand, you have the, the, the old fort, on the other hand, you have the Viceroy's house. One is Viceroy's house. Number two is the old fort. Number five that you see right on top is the St. James Church. Yeah? It was a church that was built immediately after 1947, after the, the so-called first war of independence in India. And then uh, the other line bifurcates to go and touch a new square which was proposed by him where the king of england statue of the king of england would have been enshrined yeah it was never built and this access itself did not find fusion due to various political reasons i won't go into that now and here are the other images number five is the saint james church number three is jama masjid to which the, the whole road is aligned this road is aligned to Jama Masjid. It goes here. This is Jama Masjid here. And then this road it bifurcates to go and connect one of the gates of the Red Fort. Where they this is the gate, image of the gate that you see here. This is the gate from which Shah Jahan used to come to go to the mosque every day. You know? And uh, you have number five as St. James Church, which is a Christian religious symbol of the door, as you see here. Number three, which is an Islamic dome, which is the Jama Masjid. And number four is the sculpture of uh, the square and the sculpture of uh, St. George, I mean, uh, King George, sorry. And the actual relationship between these things actually empowered the parliament or the government house. Yeah? And on this axis, it is this, this angularity that actually defines the whole road network is another issue of how through geometry he established a kind of certain hegemonic relationship over an undulating landscape that's that's a different discussion i won't go into it now and and on this axis we have the rashtrapati Bhavan complex and the red fort as the symbol which went right through and through and they had a cultural center and so on here so now these five elements are actually strung in this structure and I will now show you how these uh, objects have been modified. This is a view of Jama Masjid, as you see from Kanaut Place. The distance is something like three, four kilometers. What you see here, this is the Jama Masjid dome, yeah? and this is the parliament in the foreground. So there's an actual, actual link which is established here, which is, which is this link here. Yeah? And this is my last picture. I'll conclude with this. I've taken, I think, a little over an hour. Sorry for that. <clears throat> so this is the new, the politics of new imaginaries in the Indian polity, where the power of spatial geometry is still being explored and explored in, in a celebrated way. Yeah? The numbers that you hear, one, two, three, four, that you see here. Number one is the government house, is the political power center. Okay, is the Rashtrapati Bhavan and the government houses. The second thing that you see here is India Gate, where which was a memorial built to the people who fought the World War II for the British, Indians who fought the World War II. And besides that has now come up 
uh, war museum. Yeah. So there in number two is the place where military is celebrated. Yeah. This is the military power celebrated, it's political power. Number two is the military power. Number three is where a new monument is proposed. If the competition is just going in uh, to create a very high tower, which is higher than the, uh, the Eiffel Tower to as a monument to Indian nationalism. Yeah? And very interestingly, the whole axis goes across the, this is the Yamuna River here. It goes across the river and a good four kilometers away terminates in the dome of the image that you see here of a religious institution. So you have political power, you have military power, you have nationalism, and you have religious power. So this is the new equation which defines the new India in its politics. Thank you. I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. I'll be open to questions. Thank you, sir. We will now be moving into the Q&A session. Please remember to keep your questions straightforward and to the point. Each participant will be allowed one question. The speaker and all members of the organizing committee can choose to disallow any questions under their discretion. We now open the floor for, for we now open the floor to questions. Please raise your hand and the members of our team will recognize you. Um, Professor, if I can ask a question. This is Akshat Ram from the Department of Humanities at IIT Madras. Yes, please, please ask Akshat. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, I just wanted to understand um, this, uh, especially because uh, I wasn't going to ask any question until your last uh, slide, uh, mm -hmm. where you discuss um, the the idea of uh, the idea of how um, you know uh, the concept of power is is split uh, across this whole concept of new india in in delhi i guess uh, 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 the, the concept of it my question is do you think that here in south this this uh, with the with the advent of the drag racing uh, movement as such do you think that there is um, there are these uh, you know spatial positions of power uh, that uh, the, that outcry uh, the 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 political sounds of, of, of a party of an individual. I mean, um, I can talk only from the Tamil Nadu political context because that's the only thing I'm well versed in. But yeah, I just want to ask that question. So, should I answer? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, it's a very interesting question because uh, Tamil Nadu is the only state which has a separate department for monuments, memorials, and monuments. Yeah. It's not monument as historic monuments that we understand, but for yes. memorials, yeah. And yes. uh, there is a celebration of memorials in Tamil Nadu. There's a whole series of memorials which have been built, starting from Annadure or going back to perhaps uh, Thiruvalluvar in Ambasamudram. Yes. You have this enormous, uh, I don't know, 360 feet or whatever its height of uh, of. Uh, in Kanyakumari. Yeah, near Kanyakumari, in Ambasamutram. This is called Ambasamutram. Yes. Yeah. In Ambasamutram, you have this massive sculpture of tremendous height built all in stone. Yeah? And you have all those series of memorials which are built in Chennai along the Marina Beach. So, one after the other, every political leader is represented in the memorial on the beach. Yeah? A similar thing is also happening, had begun to happen in, in, in Delhi uh, along the Yamuna River. But uh, there is a distinction in the manner in which the memorials are articulated in, in Tamil Nadu, which is so very, very, very culturally uh, defined. In fact, for instance, the, the interest in scale. Yeah? The Tamil interest in the idea of the public 
the Tamil culture as a culture which venerates grandness and scale and venerates its leaders as people who are larger than life. That's a very specific Tamil characteristic. Yeah. Heroic worship. It starts with Kannagi, you know. Yes. It starts with Kannagi. Even today, they are comp each political party is competing to locate Kannagi statues. Yeah. So there are these kind of conceptual uh, idols who are celebrated by location and scale in Tamil Nadu. So it's a totally different type of expression from rather than one of spatial articulation. The spatial right. articulation is actually something that's inherited from the Renaissance movement. Now, uh, we are now presently also following that is because perhaps uh, we are ignorant about the fact that this has its origin in the West, that it has its origin in the Renaissance movement. But in Tamil Nadu, it is far more pure in its cultural expression. You can see the kind of scale of cinema holdings that you see in Tamil Nadu. You don't see it anywhere else. I also had the opportunity to design and build the Rajiv Gandhi Memorial at Sri Parambadu. That time oh. I had an opportunity to research into this concept of memorials in Tamil Nadu and the specific, the cultural specificity of those approaches. It's a um, long topic. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I just have a small follow up uh, to the question, uh, to the previous question, because yeah. uh, you brought up an interesting point about uh, the concept of heroic worship, and uh, you know this larger than life uh, kind of picture with regard to memorials. I want to just uh, diverse back slightly and say, um, take uh, okay, so I'm going to cut down context a little more and come come uh, to Chennai and say, take Poets Garden for example or uh, take the Fort St. George, for example, which currently houses uh, the state assembly and the and the executive office. Do you think that uh, these, these specific locations uh, and the Marina Beach as well, because uh, definitely there have been uh, way too many political contexts that, that uh, you know, the Marina Beach is seen. My question is, do you think that presently, like more actively right now in the last couple of decades, uh, these spaces have started to become uh, politically, um, how do you say, politically significant or politically important. Uh, and do you think space is being used uh, to to further an agenda? Most certainly, it is because it has now become like that whole stretch of space, starting from Fort Saint George and going almost up to Santom Church. That entire line. Is, is the line of power in Chennai, is the alignment of power in Chennai, yes. including Madras University, which is one of the best and the earliest universities in India. So they find such prominent location in, uh, across these monuments. And the and the whole lay. Hmm? Sorry? No, that was not me. I think that was somebody else. Uh, it's about anger to play, is it? Yeah, somebody's just talking in between. Sorry, yeah. Professor. Sorry, yeah. So that that's actually an alignment that is developed over a period of time, but not structured, spatially structured in the manner in which you saw the structuring of, uh, of uh, you know, different, uh, what you call, foundations of a certain ideology is taking place. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. It's a different kind of expression. Right. But it's a structure. It'd be very interesting to inquire into that structure. This is, these are not, uh, I don't know whether they are deliberate. For instance, the Akshar Dham, which is a religious uh, entity, was designed 10 years ago. And at that time, for reasons best known to the people who did it, it was kept in exact alignment with the theodolite with the dome of the Rashtrapati Bhav. Was that an act of design? Did that anticipate all this that's happening now in between? I don't know. It looks like it's a historic, you know, kind of condensation of historic events, which finally finds its own alignment in a power structure. It's a very interesting inquiry of spatiality.
Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Katie. Uh, thank you so Hi. much for this very interesting session. Um, what I want to ask you is that, you know, uh, as urban designers, we generally associate the structuring of a city with, you know, the structuring of these uh, powerhouses, you know, like the Religious Institute, the, uh, you know, pow uh, political power, and the other, you know, uh, powers of that time. Uh, but when we look at uh, our future, if we want to really dilute these powers and we really want, uh, you know, a society which does not have this kind of polarization, do you think we, will, we would lose a very important structuring system in our cities? You know, in, in, in such a case, maybe the highways or the roads or maybe, uh, you know, the common man's vote, the structuring element. Do you think we could kind of, you know, lose the uh, importance of uh, grandeur in our cities in the coming times? It, the power equation that we already have. Thank you for the question about this. Uh, actually, the, it depends on where you shine your torch. I've shined my torch in the center of power. Shine it elsewhere, <laughs> another form of structure will reveal itself. So, uh, a city is not made up of just one kind of speciality. There are multiple specialities which progressively, uh, through accretion, forms the structure of the city. Yeah. So even in small locations, even in the location of a tree and a little shine under it, you can see a structure. Yeah. It depends on where you shine your torch and what is your line of inquiry. Here, my line of inquiry was specifically to, to demonstrate how spatiality is an instrument of anchoring power. That was my intent in shining the torch on that specific location. You show your torch elsewhere, you'll find a totally different structure. And I'm sure an equally important, equally uh, interesting structure. But since Delhi is defined as the capital city, and even when the British built the, their capital, they built a capital city for which they found a certain structure. We continue to use the same city as a capital. So it's the capital function which is uh, which has uh, become a certain speciality and a structure in that location. You, ch you shine your torch elsewhere, you will find something else and which are equally engrossing. It's that we need to inquire more and more into these, the speciality of cities and how those specialities in fact define the nature of the city or the character of the city. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Hello, Katie. This is Michelle from US. Uh, yes, Michelle. Hi. How are you? <laughs> just, just, I'm good. Great. It's 2 a.m. in the morning, but it was so interesting that I couldn't stop myself from watching this. And you started the very, uh, very abstract concept of uh, space, time, and shunita. I was just thinking in a very broad perspective. Uh, does this relate to Einsteinian theory of uh, the black hole? And then the question of matter and antimatter, uh, is it all related? Or you think that th those are different definitions of uh, Shunita or the Sahasra Chakra or the Chakra above that? Are they all different perceptions and interpretations of space and uh, individuality, as you said, the space inside you and outside you? So all these things, do you think are related? So, uh, Michelle, uh, in fact, uh, I said in the beginning that space is all-pervading, omnipresent, and it's everywhere in everything. The laws of physics and the conceptualization in religions are all different manifestations of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, from that perspective, you can say they are one. At the same time, if you apply uh, if you see the window of which they opened, a window of science that was opened to look at the black hole, 
that's quite different from the idea of shunyata because mm. shunyata is absence a black hole yeah. is not yeah. defined it's not defined as absence if anything it is defined as an intense form of energy mm. now you can say there is a dichotomous relationship between energy and form so it depends on how you look at it something is a particle and something is an uh, is a form of energy yeah. so the whole particle physics is structured around this idea that depending on your viewpoint the form can change i see mm -hmm. so there are various different culturally nuanced viewpoints in fact many of these things that i talked about today also are very nuanced they can they can them one of them can become a topic of a discussion because yeah. there are so many variations so many different manifestations so many changing conditions of culture and its expressions that this uh, this uh, the examples can be just infinite are they the same they are the same on one plane and they are completely different because they are seen through a certain cultural window that is open to look at it all right thank you so much for your answer i don't know if it was contextual in this but i just thought <laughs> i don't know if it was an answer or it was not an answer mission thank you <laughs> thank you So, it's no more questions or other questions. I are being don't raised. think there are any more questions. I mean, at least nobody has raised their hand in the. Ah, okay. All right. So, you can take a call. Check in here. Uh, sure, Professor. Uh, do any of you all have any other questions? If you all do, could you please raise your hand so then we can call you out and you can ask your question. Um, I don't think there are any other questions, Professor. So, do you have any closing remarks, Professor? Or no, uh, I I can only do the closing remark by saying that what I have shown is actually just the tip of an iceberg. Yeah. There there are so many different nuanced uh, uh, existences within the idea of speciality, yeah. and. Uh, I would like to conclude once again by thanking you for choosing a subject as speciality, which is actually about the subjective relationship between space and our perception. Thank you. That's my closing remark. <laughs>